Welcome to All Real Estate All the Time with Whitney Nicely. Whitney is the principal broker for Whitney Buys Houses and the principal auctioneer for Nicely Done Auctions. She owns a real estate portfolio, including land, houses, and apartment buildings across East Tennessee. Whitney will teach you how to purchase real estate for profit and lifelong goals. You don't need to be a real estate agent to be a good real estate investor. And now the star of her own show, Whitney Nicely. Hey there, this is Whitney Nicely, and I am so excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, this is my first show, so if you would, let's just take a second and pretend it's a little bit of a first date, and I'll introduce you to myself so that you know why I'm talking about real estate, you know how I became a real estate investor, and I'll just give you some of the background history about me so that I'm not just this random talking head telling you about how to buy land and houses, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a... Um, a resume, if you will, but in more of a first date kind of scenario. So anyway, I uh, walked across the stage at UT in December of 07. So smack dab in the middle of the recession, I graduated from UT with a degree in communication studies. Well, Monday before I walked on Saturday, my mom sat me down for a little heart to heart. And my mom and I always have our heart to hearts at the nail salon. So we're in a very friendly environment when she, you know, breaks the news to me. And what she said was, what are you going to do after you graduate on Saturday? I said, well, I'm going to go to jewelry school and I'm going to grade diamonds and I'm going to learn all about cut and clarity and everything there is to know about jewelry and pretty stuff. And in my mind, I was going to travel the world and wear pretty dresses and fancy jewelry and, you know, 60 karat diamonds around my neck. And I just thought that this was going to be my life because I'd been in college for four and a half years and that's where I thought I was going. So my mom kindly told me um, while we were getting our nails done that that was probably not going to be a good career choice at that point because we were in the middle of the recession and people weren't really buying jewelry like they were in my mind, okay? It wasn't like it was in the movies and it wasn't the height of the housing bubble and everything wasn't just hunky-dory. We were having some serious trouble in the country and my mom was trying to lead me in a different direction. So I thought about it for a couple of days and I decided that mom was probably right and it probably would not be a good time to go to jewelry school. She also told me that she wasn't going to pay for it, which was also, you know, a slap in the face because so far she'd paid for everything. So Wednesday night at dinner, I told my mom, I said, okay, I've got a different plan. I don't want to go to jewelry school. I'm not going to grade diamonds. I am going to real estate school. And I thought that I could list houses and make, you know, $20,000 a month by listing and selling houses. And again, I could wear the pretty dresses and I could buy the jewelry, even though I couldn't grade it myself. I'd still be able to go to the fancy parties and all the events. And, you know, maybe I'd get into investing one day if I got tired of buying jewelry. So I just decided I was going to go to real estate school and become a realtor. Realtor, not realtor, realtor. So my mom told me at dinner that that would probably be a terrible idea because it was still December of 2007 and we were still very much in the middle of a recession. Okay. My, just a side story. My mom is completely awesome. Okay. At this point in the story, she is owning, co-owning or running about five different small businesses. So she really has her hand on what's going on in the market, in the world. Very smart woman. And she told me, again, that would probably not be a good idea right now because nobody was building houses, nobody was flipping houses, no permits were being pulled to build new houses. I would probably not be able to make enough money to pay my rent, and I lived with mom, so that was going to be, you know, a huge deal if I couldn't pay mom rent to live in her house. So, I had been thinking about what I was going to do for about six weeks at this point. Okay. So in November of 07, I probably decided that's when I needed to decide what I was going to do when I graduated. Even though I'd had four years while I was there to make a career choice, I was waiting until the last minute. So in the course of a week, my mom busted two of my dreams that I'd been dreaming up over the last four or six weeks. So not that big of a bubble bust, but still in my, you know, college crazy girl brain, it was a huge setback. So finally, Thursday, after 
I went to work. I did have a college job. So I went to work and I came back home and I asked my mom. I said, all right, fine. If you don't think I should go to jewelry school and you don't think that I should go to real estate school and you don't think that I'm going to be able to make, you know, 20 grand a month because that was what I thought everybody should be making at that point. What do you think I should do, mom? <laughs> I'll never forget. My mom said, well, I'm running, owning or co-owning about five different companies. Why don't you work for me? And I don't know why it had never really occurred to me that I should be working for my mom, but I guess something in my stubborn head, I just knew that I could make it in the world without working for my mom. Well, obviously I thought about that for about a minute and said, oh yeah, that is a good idea. <laughs> I guess I should work for you. <laughs> what do you want me to do? <laughs> and she said, I want you to go to the office on Friday. Remember, I'm graduating on Saturday at this point. I want you to go to the office on Friday and ask your grandfather if he can give you a job. And I thought, oh, well, of course he's going to give me a job. He's my grandfather. Duh. So I went up there on Friday. I think I took the afternoon off from the job that I had and went up there to ask my papa if he would give me a job after I graduated from college the next day. And I remember him laughing and saying, well, I guess we could find something for you to do. Just come on in to work on Monday and we'll, we'll find you something. So I did. Graduated on Saturday, walked the stage, everything was fine. And if you are a young person right now and you're thinking about doing that extra semester so that you get another season's worth of tickets or you just think you need that extra six months to, you know, figure out what you're going to do with your life, don't. Just do it in four years, all right? Don't be a weirdo like me. Just get it done, get it on with, and you'll be fine for it. Also, don't wait until you graduate, the week before you graduate, to start thinking about what you're going to do kind of get that in your head also and I, I know when my mom told me that we were having this recession I seriously looked at her and said oh I thought that was just something they were talking about in the news she was like yeah because it's actually happening so pay attention to what's going on especially if you are still in college or if your kids are in college make sure that they are in this you know little fairy tale world but make sure they are keeping a good tab on what's actually going on because I was not prepared for the real world all right so continuing on in the story, Monday, I went to work and this was December. So worked on through Christmas, no big deal. And then January happened and I was really fully employed. Okay. No more games, no more celebrating, graduating, no more any of this stuff. So I, you know, when I told my mom that I wanted to go to jewelry school and I told her I wanted to go to real estate school, I was kind of thinking that she would pay for that. And she told me very quickly that she was not going to be paying for me to go to any more schooling. So again, burst in my bubble because I would not saved any money. I was spending everything I was making at my college job and living at home. So you know how that was going. So I decided that if I wasn't going to get school paid for, then I needed to just go to work, keep my nose down and do a good job. Well, I had also thought that I was going to be wearing all these pretty dresses and going to all these fancy parties and, you know, just living this real glamorous old Hollywood lifestyle. And I showed up, I realized in January of 2008, I went to meet with my sorority sisters for dinner one night and I showed up in steel toed boots and dirty blue jeans, like Levi's, not even like nice sevens jeans, like straight up blue jeans. Uh, I was wearing a Carhartt jacket and I had just taken off my new shiny hard hat with a big purple W on the front of it. So I had gone in December thinking I was going to wear, you know, evening gowns almost every day to hardcore working in the field. And that was my dose of reality that I was not going to be making 20 grand a month for a while. All right. So I am working, working, working at my mom's company. And I will tell you that her company is a dump truck company. So I was working in the safety department and I was working with the truckers. If they had an accident, like had a wreck out on the interstate, I would go fill out the report, send it to the insurance company. I was HR. I was the safety department. Okay. I got myself in a situation where I started doing the drug tests. So I was, you know, not taking blood or anything, but you know, here, 
take this in the bathroom, bring it back full, I'll send it off, that kind of thing. Here, blow in this tube, I'll see if you're drunk on the job, that kind of thing. That was my job, okay? So I had gone completely from, you know, thinking I was gonna be at all these parties and all these diamond parties and all this real estate events to doing drug tests for truck drivers. And it was fun, it was great, but I needed that extra hustle in my life because I just wasn't very excited about that kind of nine to five job. So what I started doing was selling dump trucks. And I sold dump trucks for about five years. I would sell them to dirty old men who would travel to our truck yard out in Newmarket and I would sell them our old fleet. If we retired a dump truck, not a dump truck driver, but if we retired a dump truck, I would sell it to somebody. Now, when I sold these trucks, I was making like $500 a pop off each sale. So that was, you know, bringing up my hustle income. All right, now, if you're ready for more of this story, be back in just a second. I'm gonna continue on and tell you how real estate really started to get involved in my life. Be back in a minute. Welcome back to All Real Estate, All the Time with Whitney Nicely, where we teach you the ins and outs of buying real estate in Knoxville. Now, here's Whitney. All right, so the name of the show is All Real Estate All the Time, not Whitney Buys Trucks. All right, Whitney Buys Houses. So I am selling dump trucks, I am working with dump truck drivers, and I turn around and the next thing I know, my mom is paying for me to go to more school but she's paying for me to go to mining school. So I am certified as of March of 08 to teach dump truck drivers how to be surface miners. So you see these quarries out around town. I taught our drivers how to drive a dump truck on a mine site. Now keep in mind, I don't have a CDL, but the federal government, MSHA, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, they say that I have the capability to teach somebody how to drive a dump truck on a surface mine. So I did that and I sold dump trucks for about five years. Well, turn around and it's the summer of 2011. My mom and my papa are trying to buy a piece of property. And this is a piece of property where we have, my family owns a lot of other property. It's commercial and industrial property and they're trying to buy a house, a residential property right in the middle of it. So I got kind of involved because I'm nosy and I'm a busybody. So I got into it and I realized that this agent was probably gonna make some pretty good money on this deal. And I'm gonna use round numbers because I'm from PAL and that's what we do. But round numbers work for me when I'm talking, especially like this, when I don't have a board where I can draw the picture out for you. So let's say that my mom and my papa are trying to buy this property and it is right at 15 acres. There's a little, two bedroom, one bath house on it, nothing major, but it connects to another 20 acre piece of property that they own. So they're trying to buy this house too, and the 15 acres. They really like the land more than the house. So, and like I said, my family owns tons and tons of acres on this little stretch of road. So this is just another one that we were getting in our portfolio. And I started really paying attention to the way this real estate deal was working. And I looked at the agent and at the closing, I felt like I had done all the work. Of course, I hadn't, I hadn't done anything, but I saw him basically just showing up with a key and letting us in to look at the house. And I could have done that. I didn't see all the back end stuff that he did. I didn't see all the work that he'd put into it. I didn't see his advertising budget. I didn't see the other people that he'd shown the house or the other contracts that had fallen through. I didn't see any of that. All I saw was our easy looking deal. And it was so easy, I decided that mom, it was time. I was going back to real estate school. So let me just tell you another quick little bit about this story. We were supposed to close on Friday at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon and my papa came in to my mom and told him told her on Thursday that he wanted out of it she could go ahead and buy it if she wanted to but he was out and he was done and I thought well that was kind of weird um I wonder why he decided he didn't want it so my mom just you know jumped on board and bought it herself and no problem and just hammered through it well 
those are two very important lessons that I'll come back to in just a half a second or probably after the next break. But so I saw this agent and let's say that this is not the price of this house, but let's say for easy round numbers, the purchase price was $100,000. And let's say, you know, in my mind, I still think that every real estate agent, every realtor in America probably makes 20 grand a month off of every sale, you know, just based on $100,000 houses. And obviously, if you know anything about real estate, the commission breakdown is not like that. And that is not what happens. And you probably, if you're in commercial real estate, you probably, you know, would laugh at $20,000. If you're a big fancy broker, you would probably laugh at $20,000 a month. But most agents are not killing it at 20 grand a month. But in my crazy girl brain, that's what they're bringing in. So I look at this agent and I look at the closing documents and of course i can barely read it i mean it looks like an excel spreadsheet with a bunch of words on it but i could read the line very clearly that broke out his real estate commission and since he was representing the buyer and the seller on this let's say for round numbers that he was getting 10 percent on this deal okay he's not we're using round numbers it's all really make believe and pretend here y'all just hang out with me for a second so he was making basically ten thousand dollars off this $100,000 $100,000 property. Well, duh, you only have to do two of those a month to make that 20000 that I just knew every agent was making. So, of course, I get really excited again. And I'm like, all right, mom, it's time. I'm going to real estate school. And she was like, no, I'm not paying for it. You can't go to real estate school. You've got to go to work. You've got, you know, I'd moved out into one of her rental houses at this point. So I really did have rent now that I had to pay. And she just knew that I couldn't take off six weeks or eight weeks to go to real estate school. Well, I found a school off Alcoa Highway that I could go to at night. So for two weeks, four or five hours every day after work, I would go to real estate school and I thought this would be a great plan. But remember, I also want her to pay for it. And she told me when I graduated that she wasn't paying to send me to any more schooling. Well, my brother was still in college. And so he was still on, you know, the family payroll that looks more like a uh, allowance than an actual payroll. I was on the real payroll at this time. So I said, well, I'll take my brother with me. And I know you're going to pay for him, but you're not going to pay for him and not pay for me. So you'll have to pay for both of us to go to real estate school. And mom thought about it for a second. She said, what are you going to do with a real estate license? I said, well, we've got, I mean, the family's got all these rental properties. We've got commercial and industrial properties and, you know, our cousin is running it, but he's kind of up towards retirement age. I could get a real estate license and list it and lease it as a real estate agent instead of just as a owner in the family. So she thought about it for a couple of days and she decided, all right, fine, go ahead with you and your brother can go to real estate school and you can start working you know, part-time for our real estate division, renting and leasing our properties. I thought, sweet, I got her to pay for it, yay. So Tyler and I, my brother and I go to real estate school in the summer of 2011. And I thought, you know, again, by, if we go to school in August, then by probably takes a minute to get the permits or the licenses or whatever I'm gonna need. So by the 1st of October, I'm gonna be looking at that $20,000 a month payday, right? even though my plan was just to lease our property and I hadn't negotiated with anybody how much I was gonna get paid for it, much less if they're just gonna feed me lunch or not. (laughs) So I had a rude awakening again when I went to apply for my real estate license. Apparently you have to have a broker support this little endeavor. So you have to know somebody that already is a real estate agent before you can just go hang your license on a wall somewhere. So we had some friends who had a real estate auction company and I called them one day and said, hey, uh, we got a real estate license. Would you mind taking us on? I mean, do you have room for two more agents who don't really want to be agents? We just want to list and lease the family's rentals. And they, you know, were very nice. They were very good friends. And they said, okay, yeah, fine. If that's all you're going to do, then that's fine. Well, I got into it a little bit and I leased one or two properties and I made like a hundred bucks. Okay, they were paying me like they would pay any normal listing agent. And I got like a hundred bucks. Thanks for signing somebody up to lease our property with. So I thought, all right, fine, I need to make more money. I'm going to list a house. And I just knew that my goal for the year was going to be to list one house. And I think this is in 2012. So our insurance agent at the time let me list her house. 
and I think the sales, the listing price was 89,000. We settled out at 82,000 when I found a buyer for it. And at the closing table, I remember very clearly telling the other agent involved that it was my first listing. It was my first sale and I was so excited. And she looked at me like I had lost my mind. <laughs> and she said that this was the most textbook listing the most textbook closing, the easiest transaction, I mean, the most probably boring purchase and sale that she had ever been a part of. And that was my first experience. So I thought, <laughs> I'm a natural. <laughs> I'm just so great at these listing houses and selling them. I didn't even have any trouble. This woman usually has trouble. I'm great. Wrong. <laughs> That's not exactly what was happening. So I had this wonderful experience with my first listing and it was probably another six months before I got my next listing. My next listing was a headache from the absolute beginning and I'm going to wait to tell you that story in just a half a second. Um, if you are interested in more of what I do or how I buy houses now, you can go to WhitneyBuysHouses.com and if you have a vacant house that you would like to sell, then please fill out the seller lead sheet and schedule an appointment for me to call you back. I would love to talk to you about vacant houses or if you're a landlord and you want to get rid of some problem tenants. I love those houses also. If you have a big pretty piece of property and you want to auction it, I would love to talk to you about an auction too. I've got a whole different speech for if I buy your house versus if I'm going to help you auction your house. So call me, let me know. Um, the phone number at the office for Whitney Buys Houses is 865-309-4500. And the auction phone number is 865-309-5700. But either way, you're going to get me on my cell phone. So go ahead and give us a call or you can go to WhitneyNicely.com if you're interested in more of my back history, if I haven't told you enough so far. But coming up after this quick commercial break is going to be my second listing, which was an absolute disaster. And Adam's giving me the signal now that I need to stop talking. So y'all stay tuned. You're listening to 98.7 News Talk, and we'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to All Real Estate, All the Time with Whitney Nicely, where we teach you the foundation of real estate investing for profits. Now, here's Whitney. Hey, this is Whitney again. I am from Whitney Buys Houses. In case you weren't here earlier, we are on a first date here. So I'm explaining a little bit about how I got into real estate and why I am such a real estate nerd here three or four or five, six years later. So at this point in the story, I think it is 20, it's the fall of 2012 and I have listed and sold one house. It was fabulous. I got lots of compliments on how wonderfully executed it was and how, you know, just beautiful the whole process was. All right. But my second listing came later, probably three or four or five months later. And it, I was at a barbecue with some of my friends and one of the guys happened to mention that I had a real estate license. Well, that prompted another fellow that was there to say, oh, well, I was thinking about selling my houses. Why don't you come list them for me? And of course, since I've just had this one perfect listing and sale, and I think I'm the next greatest thing in real estate, even though I've had a license for like a year and a half and I've only done one transaction, I think, great. Yeah, here's another chance. Here's another wonderful opportunity for me to bust out in the real estate market in Knoxville. So I go you know, this is over the weekend. So Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday or sometime, I go over to his house and we're talking about listening it. And basically I'm going to give you the real numbers on this situation because it's incredible. These are real numbers. This is real life, true story, not made up numbers for easy math. So he wants to list his house for 199,000. All right. So right under 200,000. And when I pulled the comps, I just knew when I was going over there to talk to him that he was going to say he wanted to sell it for a buck 50. I never imagined he would want to put it on the market for 199. I mean, that just seemed like outrageous to me. So 
as soon as he said it, my jaw hit the floor, but I quickly remembered that I was the next greatest thing to hit the Knoxville real estate market and that I could totally handle it. Yeah, absolutely. If he wanted one ninety nine, I'd get him one ninety nine. No problem. So I listed it for like six months. Nothing happened. I mean, total crickets. And, you know, this is hurting my feelings because I'm the next greatest thing. All right. I've had my license for like a year and a half. I should be making 20 grand a month by now. It's not happening. Nobody's calling. Nobody's even pretending to call. I haven't ever had a showing on it. I've, you know, practically forgotten the basics by this point. And I'm just, I don't know what to do. So he calls me up one day and he's like, hey, what's going on? Tell me the latest. And I was like, well, there's nothing to tell you. Nothing has happened. I mean, nothing has happened. He was like, well, you think we should drop the price? And I was like, yeah. I told you six months ago that we were maxing out at a buck fifty. One hundred fifty thousand was going to be the most you could ever hope for in this house. He said, "All right, I hear what you're saying. Go ahead and drop it." I said, "Sweet, one hundred fifty. And he said, "Nah, one sixty nine. I think we could get one sixty nine for it." I was like, "Oh, okay, fine. We'll try it again at one sixty nine." So. I redid the contract, did the paperwork. You know, my broker's trying to, you know, be very calm and patient with me. And put it back up on the MLS for 169 And in a week, I had about three or four phone calls on it. I even showed the house once. And then, probably in the second week that I had it up back at 169 an agent called me. And she was working with some buyers who actually lived down the street from my property that I had listed. And they wanted to go see it. I thought, okay, cool. They already like the neighborhood. So did the whole dog and pony show, showed them the house. They wrote a contract and I think they wrote it for like one, one fifty nine. And that was contingent on a inspection, which is very normal, very cool, totally part of the process. I'd, you know, been through an inspection on that first perfect listing that I had and it was all fine. Nothing came back wrong. Well, I knew that the second house that we were talking about, I knew it was going to have a worse inspection because this house was built in like 1924. Okay. If nothing was wrong with it, it was going to be, I mean, there's just no way nothing was going to be wrong with this house. In fact, I knew there was a couple problems and being a silly new listing agent, when I talked to the inspector, I started telling him everything that was wrong with the house. Are you kidding me? I mean, seriously why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense at all. But I did. I just confessed everything I knew about the house to the inspector. So, and one of the things that I knew was wrong with it is that my buddy, remember I'd listen to my buddy's house, he'd come home after a couple adult beverages and he left his key wherever he had been. So he didn't have a key to get into his house. So he just broke the window on the back door and unlocked the door, went on in, everything was cool. Well, he never fixed the window. So he's got this piece of plastic, piece of plywood, this piece of nothing in this beautiful old original 1920 something door. Obviously that's going to need to be fixed. Okay. That was, you know, we all knew going into the inspection that that was going to need to be fixed. So the inspector came back and, um, you know, there was some bigger issues, but the people were ready for those and they wanted, you know, they wanted that window fixed. One of the stairs creaked. They wanted that fixed little to nothing they wanted fixed okay all in all done they wanted like fifteen hundred dollars from the inspector what he'd found wrong fixed one was a loose tile in the bathroom i mean like nothing 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 well my seller wouldn't do it he was completely okay with taking their hundred and fifty nine thousand, but he was not budging he was not going to fix anything all the stuff they wanted done he said they could see it when they saw it the first time and he didn't want to fix anything just because the inspector had found it and they wanted it done now it wasn't his problem he wasn't doing it so my broker and the other agent and i tried and tried for like a week to keep this deal together but it just dissolved i mean like sand in your hand at the beach just boom it went away Okay, my seller wasn't doing anything. They weren't going to work with him if he wasn't willing to put $1,500 into the house. So it just died. The whole deal just died. And, you know, I was just crushed. I was absolutely crushed because I just knew I was going to be able to handle this like I handled my first one. Well, I couldn't. And he said, we'll just put it back on the market. You had a bunch of calls on it. We'll put it back on the market. Somebody else will come back and want it. Put it back on the market. Nobody called. 
I had absolute crickets. Nobody even like wanted to look at it. So I don't know if it got published in some paper that I wasn't a member of or what, but everybody seemed to know that my seller wasn't willing to play ball and nobody called on it. No other agent made any kind of attempt to contact me. So we're getting close to November and December. Nobody's called. Nobody wants this house. And he calls me right at the beginning of December. And I don't know how much you know about real estate or how active you are, but nothing really happens in December. I mean, yeah, there's a couple hundred closings and there's a couple agents in town that they're still going to be out there killing it. But for the most part, nothing's really going on. And I had planned to go on like a two week vacation. Okay. So I wasn't even going to be in town to deal with any real estate and nobody been calling me for like a month or two anyway. So it wasn't a big deal when I planned my vacation. He called me like on a rainy, ugly December day and said, Hey, let's drop it to 129. And I thought I was going to see stars. I could not believe that we had gone from 199 to 169 to a contract with somebody who was going to pay 159 if he would fix $1,500 to now dropping it to 129. I, I just saw $30,000 go up in a poof of smoke and I couldn't handle it. Y'all, I just, <laughs> I probably said some very ugly things. And since I had said those things, there was probably no repairing our relationship at that point. And my listing was set to expire anyway at the end of December. So I think I probably just canned my friend. And that was probably a very unprofessional situation. But, you know, I and my crazy girl brain think I am the next greatest thing. And I've got all these great answers. And he, I felt like this seller had stolen $30,000 from me. <laughs> okay. I had a contract. I had a buyer for $159. And then he dropped it to $129 with no reason, no nothing. And I felt like that was my money because I'm a control freak. So I got mad. I just dropped the listing. A good agent probably would not have done that, but I'm clearly not a good agent at this point. <laughs> so I decided then and there that I needed more control. I am a control freak from day one. I'm total type A personality. And if somebody is going to be able to jerk me around over $30,000 and play with my emotions like that, then I need to have more control in the property. And that was the last house that I listed. Okay. I, I just knew that this was not for me. Uh, the first one was a fluke and that's not how I was going to make my stance on the Knoxville real estate market as the latest and greatest thing. So I had to back up lick my wounds and figure out how I was going to either just buy the houses and be a landlord because that's fine. I'd seen my mom do that. I'd seen my family do that. And I loved that process. Okay. It totally fit me because I could control it. And as long as I was in control of the property and if anybody decided that we were going to drop it 30,000, then I would have known that up front. So I started looking around and finding ways that I could buy properties. And over the next year, my brother and I bought three properties. Um, two of them we still have, and one of them was an, another disaster that I will tell you about after this break. And I will also tell you how I buy houses now. And I'm not going to say I am the newest, latest, and greatest thing to hit the real estate market in Knoxville, but I do have my own radio show now. So that's pretty cool. And if you're listening, I do buy houses. I would love to come buy your house. Please call 865-309-4500 or check out WhitneyBuysHouses.com and I will be glad to come look at your property. I talked to two sellers this morning. I'm going to look at another one in Jefferson City this afternoon and I buy houses. So give us a call. Welcome back to All Real Estate, all the time, with the only general contractor in town who wears a dress every day, Whitney Nicely. Hey y'all, it's Whitney. I am with Whitney Buys Houses, and today I am going through the first date with you, okay? So I have told a little bit about how I got into real estate, and this is going to be a 
more in depth on my first house that I ever bought. Okay. The name of my real estate firm is Whitney Buys Houses. And that's what we do is we buy houses because I am a control freak and I am a terrible listing agent. I'm terrible working with buyers and being a buyer's agent. I want to buy the house and then figure out what I'm going to do with it. Okay, so in 2013, summer of 2013, my brother and I decided that we were going to become real estate investors as well as real estate agents. And we bought three houses in one summer, which was, you know, for a couple of 20 year olds, that was pretty cool. Um, I think I was actually 27 or 28, which would have made him 23 or four. So we're, we're very mid 20s here, just out buying houses like it's cool. So we bought one house and it was great. Actually, I'm going to have to tell you about that one on a totally different day because it was not great. And then the second house, we just had to put a bathroom in, which sounds kind of small, but it was a big ordeal also. So I'll tell you about that one next week. But this week, I want to tell you about our biggest to date, probably failure. And that is because we bought a house at an online auction and I was going out of town on vacation the day that it was selling. And so I just told my brother to drive by and check it out. Well, it was, you know, the agent, the auction company that we were working for as agents at that point had it listed. So we got the code. We went in. Tyler looked at it and he was like, don't buy this house. It's a dump. It's awful. The floors are wobbly. There's some bugs in here and there's no kitchen appliances. Don't buy it. Please, Whitney, don't buy it. I was like, okay, cool. But if you were going to buy it, how much would you pay? And he was like, well, just don't pay more than $10,000. Whitney, just don't. I mean, it's a bad part of town. Over the hill, that would be fine. But I just, I don't, I don't like it here, Whitney. Don't, don't buy this one. And I was like, all right, that's cool. So as soon as I hung out, hung up with him, I hopped on my little internet box called the phone and put a bid in on the property. And if you've been to an auction, especially an online auction, you know that you can put in your highest bid. That way, if somebody else puts a bid in and you're still winning, it'll bid for you. Okay. Um, it's really, really fun. And I encourage everybody to buy at real estate auctions and online real estate auctions, especially. Um, but if you were going to do that, I would really strongly encourage you to look at the property. And if you do look at the property or your brother looks at the property and they say, don't buy it, then don't buy it. But because I just, again, knew I was going to be the latest and greatest thing to hit Knoxville real estate market, I put a bid on it. And he told me not to go any higher than 10000 So I thought, well, 10000 that's too low for this house. Surely we could buy it for 15000 and if nothing else, sell it for thirty. I mean, that's how real estate works, right? You just double down on your money no matter what the formula says or what the neighborhood says or what the comps say. or You just go with your gut. That's how you make money in real estate. Just kidding. Just kidding. Please don't let anybody think that's what I'm preaching here. So we bought the house for 15000 And it was just as much of a disaster as he said it was. And we bought it, closed on it in like July of that summer. I couldn't rent it because I didn't want to put any appliances in it because I was honestly kind of afraid to leave appliances in it until somebody was living in it, but nobody would want to look at it because it didn't have any appliances in it. So I was in this merry-go-round of a bad situation and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. So nobody wanted to look at it because it was kind of overgrown. So I sent the landscaping company out there and my yard guy called me back and he was like, Hey, Whit, I'm going to have to hire somebody else just to sit in the truck because I'm afraid that if we leave the truck unattended just to go mow the backyard, the stuff won't be in the trailer when we get back. So are you willing to cover that? I was like, Oh, wow. I have really messed up here. I mean, bad. So I said, no, 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 I don't want to cover that. I'll come over there and sit and watch the truck while y'all mow it. You know, that way I can be there to watch the progress to make sure that what I'm spending my money on actually gets done. Right. Y'all, I got creeped out just sitting in the backyard watching the truck while they were around front mowing the front yard. So this is not a house in a neighborhood that I should have bought. And if you're uncomfortable buying the house, you have no business buying the house. So don't buy it if you're not comfortable, especially if you're not comfortable leaving appliances in it overnight. And, you know, I thought this was on a nice road. I, I'd been to houses in this neighborhood. I, I thought it was all fine. 
but there was just something about this house that I never really liked. So we couldn't sell it. We listed it for 30000 Nobody would even call us back. I mean, nobody wanted this house. Dropped it down to twenty five. Still no calls. Dropped it down to 20000 Nobody called. I called those signs out at the four lane that say, I buy houses cash. I buy houses fast. I called those guys, okay? And I am one of those guys now. But at that time, I didn't know what they knew. So I just called them and I was like, hey, I paid 15000 for this house. Will you just give me my 15000 back and you can have it? And they were like, well, how much is it worth? And I was like, well, I've got it listed for 20000 and nobody will give me 20000 It's on the MLS. And they said, then it's not worth 15000 <laughs> And I was like, yes, it is. It, it so is because I gave 15000 for it. And they were like, that's not how this works. So again, I'm getting a very rude, very real life awakening in my first year. Well, it was my third investment property, but the first two were good lessons also. So finally, just desperate just to get rid of this because I, I could not go over there by myself. I didn't want to meet anybody over there. I just, I hated it. And what I decided to do before we put it back up for auction, I said, you know what, Tyler, we learned about owner financing in real estate school. We'll just put a sign up that says we'll owner finance it. I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? And he was like, no, I don't know what that means. And I was like, well, we learned about it in real estate school. So obviously we'll be able to figure it out. So we put a sign out that said owner financing. I put some ads on Craigslist that said owner financing. And one person called us back. We went and showed it to them and even they wouldn't owner finance it. And at that point, I didn't know how to screen a tenant. I didn't know how to look at setting up an owner financing situation. I just wanted to get my money back. And I thought that would be a great way to do it. Well, since that time, I have been to many, many classes and I have done about 30 different owner financing deals. And I know looking back on little Whitney back then that she was making an absolute fool out of herself. I have such a better plan now. I have such better strategies. I have formulas. I have all sorts of stuff. And I drive by that house still to this day. And I'm just embarrassed that I bought it. I'm embarrassed that I lost money on it because we did end up putting it back up on auction. We put it back with the same company and they auctioned it and it was online only auction. I was with my mom and dad that night at another real estate auction because I'm still crazy enough to think that I'm wanting to do this. And it sold for just a little over $11,000. But we lost money. Yes, all in, all done, we probably lost $4,000. And that's what everybody wants to ask me now is have I ever lost any money on a real estate investment and yes i have the third house i bought was awful but i have a great story to go along with it and i am able now to look back on what i did and know how crazy that was okay and now when i buy houses i have this story that i can rely on to say no i'm not doing that again I, i've been through that bad road and i don't want to do that again so now i know what i'm doing and there's such a better process now that i understand owner financing so yes, I have lost $4,000, but I did not get kidnapped. I did not get mugged. I did not lose my car. My lawn boy did not lose any weed eaters or, you know, man toys that he's got on the trailer and everything was fine. All we did was lose $4,000 and, you know, put that on your taxes. You lost money in real estate. Fine. At that point, most Americans had lost way more than $4,000 in real estate. So still... Tyler and I were fine. So next week, what I want to tell you about is some of the wins that we have done. As of right now, we have 15 houses and we are not losing money on those. We are not losing money on these. I know we are not losing money on these because I have three different ways to look at a house now. There's three things that you should definitely do before you buy a property. And to make sure you're not going to lose money on these, you should, first of all, go look at the property. Okay, that was my biggest mistake is I didn't look at it. I didn't put my hands on it. I just went with what my brother said and then I completely ignored his advice. Okay, so that's part A and B of lesson one. Lesson two, you should have a formula. You should know the money that you're gonna have at stake. You should be aware of what you are spending and what you are buying and what kind of return you're gonna get for that money that you're putting down. All right, and the third thing you should do is you should know what your exit strategy is gonna be. And when I started investing and started going to the Real Estate Investors Association, everybody was talking about their exit strategy and this and that and the other. And I thought, well, I mean, there's the red signs above all the doors. How could you not know what the exit strategy is? Duh. And 
Exit strategies are different, okay? If you're going to buy a house and you're going to fix it and flip it, that's an exit strategy. If you're going to buy a house and you're going to hold it and have it for 20 years and rent it as you know, re- retirement income, then that's an exit strategy. But if you want to do a lease option or an owner financing, that could also be completely different exit strategies. And just like anything in life, you know, there's plan A, B, and C. Well, you should have exit strategy A, B, and C in place. So if one doesn't happen, you're not just hanging out with your brother trying to figure out what you're going to do. You actually have a plan and a strategy in place. So if you have an empty house and you would like to hear more about my formulas or what I do and how I buy houses with owner financing and lease options, please go to WhitneyBuysHouses.com or WhitneyNicely.com. Give us a call at the office, 865-309-4500. And I really appreciate y'all listening to me this morning. I'll be back next week with more exciting news from real estate.